Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Call to Be podcast, where we seek to empower everyday believers to discover and live out their authentic calling in Christ to be a greater blessing in our world today. I'm Reverend Dr. Travis Guzzi. I'm Executive Director of Wellness and Coaching for the Southeastern District of the LCMS. I'm also an ICF Certified Life and Executive Coach and a Gallup Strengths Coach. And it is wonderful having all of our listening and viewing audience joining us for this special uh Called to Be Book Launch edition of the Called to Be podcast. And we have a special guest in studio. Am I uh, a special guest yes, at this yeah, point? You, Do I, I yeah, qualify? You, yeah, we have to bring you in online. Yes, so it's yes, nice yes, having yes, you yes, actually I'm, here in person. It's wonderful because now we don't have to worry about computers breaking on in multiple states and that kind of thing. So, yeah. No, have you no, cast no. out the demons on your uh, computer? I'm working on it. Okay, yes, good, good, yes. Good. Uh, I might call our Catholic brothers and sisters to help with some holy oil at this point. Maybe there's yes. an exorcism ritual for computers. I, yeah, I, if there isn't somebody should write one that's all i have to say like tell tell whoever tell tell the you have some influence dr kolb so tell the the commission on theology and church relationships to get on that we need an exorcism for technology can yeah. we look at like the theology surrounding that and by the way speaking of dr kolb we have a special guest who is joining us for this special edition we have uh, dr robert kolb he is professor of systematic theology emeritus at concordia seminary he's also a world renowned uh, authority on both Luther and the Reformation. And so it is wonderful having here. Dr. Kolb has been a mentor, uh, not only in my seminary education, but also in my doctoral work. He was my first reader on my dissertation as I was looking at the field of coaching and Luther's teaching on vocation. And so that's why we're bringing him here because he was a big part uh, to play of our Call to Be book. By the way, before we come to Dr. Kolb, real fast, we have a special uh, thing for you to consider. Um, we have my new book, uh, Called to Be, is about to be launched. Dr. Kolb's holding it up too. Thank you for doing that. And uh, <laughs> if you listen to the end of this podcast, we have a special offer for the first three individuals who email. We have a code word we're going to give you. And so you got to listen to the end to get that code word. And we're going to send the first three people to respond a copy of this book complimentary. Yeah, see, I was going to say, how in the world are you ever now going to include published author on the list of all of the titles that you spit out? You're going to be out of breath. I'm a certified <laughs> life coach and I'm an also a published author and I've won the Pulitzer Prize. And I <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I don't think... We, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> hey, I, I have big ambitions, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, so uh, let's get going today. Uh, Dr. Kolb, uh, it is wonderful having you here. And uh, Kevin, why don't you get us started on our conversation with him today? Yeah, well, this is really exciting to me because the thing, so I had uh, Dr. Kolb, as many did as a professor uh, back in seminary for uh, Lutheran Confessions too. at that point. And it was really my first time reading through the confessions in one kind of fell swoop. And what I always loved about Dr. Kolb's class is he was really good about bringing in all of the history surrounding what was going on at the time when these documents were being written and then the theology behind it and then also applying it to our contemporary situation. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and I think that we're going to be doing some of that today surrounding vocation, which uh, Dr. Kolb also has plenty to say, I am sure. And so we're very, very happy to have him here. And uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to this conversation. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Cole, let me start us off by asking this question. Um, what made you take such a deep dive <laughs> into studying the Reformation and Martin Luther? What was it about uh, those subjects that really has led you to devote your life to uh, teaching and research and writing? Well, I, I blame it on my um, uncle Pete and my aunt Peggy. My, uh, they were great aunt and uncle. And uh, on their living room wall, they had this huge picture of this huge man with a huge Bible in it. And as a two and three and four year old, I, I got the impression that that must be somebody important, I guess. And it turned out to be Martin Luther. Um, and actually, at the same time, my parents were beginning to um, to immerse me in Luther's small catechism, which uh, in many ways uh, formed the basic way in which I think about God and the world and, and myself. Uh, and I've always been interested in history. I think you have to be a, a gossip and a kind of detective-oriented uh, person to, to become a historian. And uh, so as... Uh, as I uh, got further on in my education, I had the opportunity to uh, go to the University of Wisconsin and study actually with a, a, a 
world renowned, really world renowned um, uh, scholar on, on John Calvin, Robert Kingdon was his name. And uh, uh, so he helped me uh, develop the skills to read the documents and to, to delve more deeply into um, to Luther. Why I keep on doing that, I think, is because I, I find him among all the the teachers of the church over 2000 years, I find him uh, perhaps more in tune uh, with where North Americans are today than, than most of the teachers of the church over the years. Um, I, he talked about righteousness, and I think that's uh, actually an, almost a synonym for the way we talk about identity, which is a very important uh, part of our our self-description and our understanding of what it means to be human. Uh, and so I just find not only uh, was it an interesting, dynamic, um, dangerous time 500 years ago as he lived, um, but but it's a time that easily relates to our own. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And, and you know, um, history informs so much. Uh, we, we tend to think we're so sophisticated and we're so advanced. And uh, we're, we were just saying back then as we are today, yep. and people back then have much to say to us today. Um, Dr. Cope, let me ask you this. So, so there's a lot of great teachings that came from Luther and out of the Reformation, justification by grace through faith, the authority of the word of God, uh, two kinds of righteousness, which I, which I definitely would like to touch base on with a little bit in this conversation today. But the one that has really, for me, I think is significant, but I think is undervalued is his teaching on vocation. Um, why don't you share a little bit about what makes Luther's teaching on vocation so significant? I think there are a couple of factors. Uh, one is the contrast with uh, with the understanding of human life um, in his childhood and youth. Um, it was a world that looked at human beings as living in one of three, um, uh, they were called estates uh, in the way we usually translate the word. I would say walks of life or situations uh, of life. Uh, you were either in the in normal family life that was always in the 16th century coupled with uh, economic activity, Luther started to distinguish the two. Uh, and Or you were in, um, you had responsibilities to govern others. So you were in the, to use Aristotle's word, politia, the society really, uh, but it's the word we get politics from. Uh, or you were in the church. And if you were in the church, you were somebody special. You had a, a calling. You had a vocation, uh, and in some Christian circles today, the term vocation still refers to those who are serving specifically in full-time uh, church work, as, as we would say. Um, and Luther broke the mold. He said all Christians are called by God to uh, do the activities that are assigned by the fact that we have responsibilities, we could call them in family or in uh, our economic lives. Uh, or in society, and uh, as well as in the church. And so Luther really enhanced what it means to be a human being in any walk of life, or really in every walk of life, because he said we're all in, in some kind of family situation. We're all in some kind of economic service of one kind or another. We're all uh, have societal responsibilities. And he would say we all have a religion. We may not be a, a formally affiliated with a church or, or another religious organization, but, but everyone has a religious part of their lives. So what Luther did was really um, affirm the value and worth of, of every life situation as part of God's plan for us. Hmm. And, um, and we are called then... Uh, out of doing it our own way, out of doing it wrong ways, uh, into his service, um, and and in th therefore into the service of humankind. Now, if I can jump in here too, because this is fascinating to me, and I guess I want to be careful how I ask this question, um, because it's not a it's not a new teaching. If you have new teaching coming into the church, we have a word for that. 
it's called heresy, <laughs> right? We don't want that. But there are rediscoveries that happen. Mm -hmm. The Reformation yeah. was all about Luther's rediscovery of the gospel. And throughout uh, church history, we have had these things where these kind of lost teachings, if you will, or maybe undervalued teachings are re-examined and they become a part of the conversation. Now, when I was a little 13-year-old at Salem Lutheran Church in Blackjack, Missouri, if you know where that is, going mm -hmm. through confirmation, I, I heard a lot about law and gospel. I knew what that was. I knew what justification and sanctification, I knew a little bit about sanctification. That was kind of a bad word back then. Justification was really important. Vocation, I never heard it, the term vocation, or, or if I did, it was very, very little. And it seems like it's become a, a much uh, wider topic of conversation. I, I just read a, um, a book by Tim Keller, actually, where he dives into the Every topic. Good Endeavor. Yeah, Every Good Endeavor. He dives yep. into it very deeply, and it was a really good read, actually. So it's part of this, this wider conversation that's happening. Do you see that, too? Do you think it's a, a something that, in a sense, has been rediscovered by the church? Is it becoming a part of a, a greater conversation that you're seeing Definitely, it, that was the case for me. I don't think uh, in our classes at the seminary, um, okay, 60 years ago, um, when I was here, uh, we, we talked about vocation. I really discovered it in graduate school when I was working on on um, Luther's reaction to the revolt of the peasants in 1525. And, and there he used the, the concept of the calling of of uh, both rulers to keep public order to protect uh, people from from public violence, and the calling of um, the peasants to be good peasants. Uh, and uh, but even then, the the secondary literature was pretty recent, and so for a long time, uh, the the understanding of vocation was there in in Lutheran circles. Um, but just not talked about and not given prominence. Um, new obedience, uh, words like that were used. Um, within Calvinism, I think um, the term vocation was perhaps heard more often. Um, but even there, the sense of vocation was there. The actual teaching of vocation as such um, was perhaps also um, neglected. And I think uh, part of part of um, why it's it's ring so true today is is the same reason that it rang true for people in the 16th century, that um, as Christians we know that that our identity as God's children is a gift, and we know that our identity as as God's children needs to be lived out, and how do we do that then? And, Luther has two answers. We do it where in the places where God calls us, and we do it by following his commands in those places. Um, and so I think, think it really meets a need uh, uh, that we all have to know what our lives are really all about. Yeah, it's a, a, with purpose. And in a way, it's, it's kind of a you know a great equalizer. And pastoral care, it allows me to talk to both a high school kid who's trying to figure out, you know, what, what am I going to do with my life? Yeah. And to have that conversation, well, what, how will, how did God put you together? And then how will you use that to love and serve your neighbor? And then even, I mean, I've had situations where you have people that are, you know, 92 years old and they're in nursing homes and they're asking, what am I doing here? Why doesn't God just take me home? And the mm -hmm. answer, a very good answer is, you are here to love and serve your neighbor. Yeah. So now in and that, this and that's, place. That's really yeah. kind of the primary it's thing amazing. for Luther. Yeah. It's, it's living out that calling we have vertically by grace through faith, yeah. but then in the horizontal, yeah. it's all about yeah. now how do we live that out in love right. and service who's, to neighbor? Who's your neighbor, right? Who's yeah. your your you know, your your grandchild or your spouse if they're still living, or even just your a neighbor across the way. How will you love and serve them today? And it's yeah. just it's so um, vibrant and relevant. I mean, yeah. I, I love it. Yeah. So. You know, it's interesting. There's a book um, that I read for my uh, dissertation. It was uh, Phyllis Tickle, who's now been called to glory. She wrote a book called The Great Emergence. Yeah. Uh, she has this imagery that every 500 
years, the church goes up into the attic and has a rummage sale and yeah. they discover like the antique road show. <laughs> oh, I love it. These great treasures. Yeah. And I think that that's what we're rediscovering vocation. Yeah. Is it's been a rich teaching mm -hmm. that we've had. It's just been kind of hidden away. Yeah. And to be able to bring it out and put it on the mantle and say, this is a value and worth. Oh, because yeah. I think what it does is it connects our faith to everyday life in a way and provides kind of a framework for understanding mm -hmm. who we are and what the life of a Christian is all about that that very few teachings seem to yeah. offer in the church. Yeah, and it, it really, it kind of ties it all together. I mean, you you it has tie-ins with, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer. I mean, every part of the catechism you can take back to vocation, and it's like the, the thread that kind of holds it all together in, in application, I've found. Yeah. Dr. Cope, let me ask you this question. So so what, for, for you know, this podcast is about helping empower everyday believers. Uh, that, that's kind of our term for the priesthood of all believers. Um, mm -hmm. Everyday believers to discover um, maybe it's discover in a deeper way and to live out more intentionally their call to be a greater blessing. Um, how does Luther's teaching on vocation help empower believers? What, what can it provide for them? Uh, nice that you say provide, because I was just going to pick up on that. Um, it, we uh, generally think that Luther doesn't talk much about God's providence, uh, but Luther is very strong in his preaching. Uh, on how God provides for us each day. And uh, he he talks about the weather as, as a means of God's provision. He talks about uh, good government keeping order as a means of, of God's provision. But in connection with his understanding of our, our Christian calling uh, in daily life, he, um, he talks about us as masks of God. Hmm. So God is really providing for us through the people around us. Um, and sometimes those people around us are very far away from us in actual distance. They're, uh, they're farming uh, uh, or raising crops in Africa or, or Central America or wherever. Uh, but but my, I don't know how you feel about your garbage uh, collectors. But Actually, I, I have am, a brother who's a garbage collector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I value them very highly yep. uh, because... Um, I would hate to have to deposit the garbage collection in the in the backyard. Well, garbage collecting is a calling from God, and yep. God provides for us in some very important ways um, through uh, through garbage collectors, for instance. And so, God's at work in our lives, taking care of us, uh, providing for us uh, by calling us to these specific responsibilities, and uh, so in in the roles that he gives us and in the functions of those roles, um, he's he's present in ways that we don't recognize uh, that he's there, uh, but he's he's the one who is putting us on as his gloves to um, handle all our problems. Yeah, and that's the whole idea of the mask of God is God works in a hidden way behind and yeah. through our vocations, our callings uh, that we have each and every day. And, um, you know, I, I, you talk about, um, you know, garbage collectors. Uh, I, I talk about where was God on 9-11? Well, God was working mm -hmm. through every person um, yeah. the 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 jet the fighter jets that were flying the protecting the city the the rescuers who are going up the stairs neighbor helping neighbor trying to get out of the buildings uh, and, and to the priest who was down there uh, praying with people through every calling and vocation God was there loving and serving through them and that and that's true in every day of our lives we just don't notice his presence in that yeah. way yeah yeah and it it becomes a interesting point of conversation and not to take the conversation um into far left field here but as artificial intelligence has become something that is now becoming a point of theological discussion and debate as we have machines now doing more and more of the jobs that people used to do i think about you know, 10 years ago, you go to Walmart and you're going to you're going to interact with a cashier, positive or negative. You're going to interact with a cashier yeah. and that cashier, God love them. They are loving and serving their neighbor through that service that they're providing, whether they know it or not. Yep. Now you have machines that are doing the same thing. So now are we advancing into territory? Are there unforeseen consequences there 
that we're that we're not seeing because of it's missing the human touch behind that. Yeah. Well, the know? reading that I hear is there there is going to be anywhere from forty to sixty percent of the global workforce that will be put out of work. Yeah. Um. In in a certain fields, and then you have so you don't have a job anymore. I mean, that does. Who am I? Meaning, purpose. I mean, those are all questions of vocation. Yeah. Yeah. I um I work for six uh, summers while I was going to school uh, in a, a, a hog slaughtering packing plant. And uh, so five times I left in at the end of August or the beginning of September to come back in the following end of May. Uh, and we had about a thousand workers in that uh, George A. Hormel plant in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Uh, every, every one of those five years out of, out of the thousand workers, two to seven had still been working at the end of August, had both retired and died in the next nine months. Mm -hmm. they, 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 their meaning and purpose for life was so invested in their work, is my theory, um, that um, they, they didn't have the will to live. Yep. They, didn't, they didn't find something to sustain them. And so I think that that, that sense of, uh, my worth doesn't come just from my job, but uh, I was going to say for, for males, but I think increasingly for females in our yep. society as well, um, uh, work and meaning in life um, are, are coordinates. And it's easy then to make our work and our activities on the job into a god. Um, that's, of course, bad. Um, but it is also part of the way God structures life um, to give us a sense of worth, secondary worth to the worth we have as simply people for whom Christ died and rose. But we have a secondary worth that uh, comes from activities as parents, as children, as uh, citizens, as members of a congregation, active in a congregation, uh, but also from our, our economic uh, employment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, um, uh, it's something that for for people who are moving into retirement, we have such a large number of boomers who are uh, entering into retirement each and every day. Um, that uh, I think that you you have to have a sense of of something to do with your life because um, re, you know being uh, retired and having nothing to do uh, gets old real fast. Yes, and it's really not just detrimental to our emotional and mental health, but also even our physical health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doctor Cole, let me ask you this question. So, so how does one practically discern and start living out their calling? Um, what what practical advice would you give to to for somebody who's saying, you know, I don't know what my meaning, my purpose is in life, what I'm supposed to do, um, and how can te Luther's teaching on vocation be informative towards that? Well, you both perhaps remember that I have one answer that suits all questions. Why do you want to know? Yep. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yep. It is a great <laughs> question to ask. <laughs> well, I think there are different different, uh, different, w different, questions in that question, let's say. Um, on the one hand, I would say, uh, just don't, don't get all uptight about it. Um, the Lord sort of pushes and shoves, and uh, uh, we can make wrong decisions, and we certainly do make decisions that we regret. And I, I wish I hadn't uh, done this or that, uh, uh, although I don't think of good examples out of my own life. Though, though. But I, I, I would say that I certainly didn't decide the path that led me to the point at which I am now. I could not have planned uh, the kind of life that, that the Lord has given me. And so on, on the one hand, I would say, just don't get uptight about it. Um, but on the other hand, people need to know, and, and uh, God said it's not good for us to be alone, and, and that's why he gives us not only Christian spouses, but Christian friends and, and, uh, and uh, Christian advisors. And so... Um, that was sort of a fat pitch, Travis, but um, uh, you've convinced me that uh, coaching does have a role uh, and uh, that that one of the best ways is 
is to get into conversation with fellow Christians, uh, and especially those who have some special training um, when the, the situations become acute, uh, and and just explore the possibilities. Um, in my uh, early years of teaching, so 40 years ago or so, let's say, um, we were we were big on spiritual gifts. And I had a very good student who would have made a super director of Christian education, was doing a great internship, and he took a spiritual gifts inventory. Uh, that, that was a, a, a test that you took and estimated what you could do well and what you couldn't do well. And he flunked. He didn't find any spiritual gifts. And he uh, quit the program and went into uh, being a bellhop in a hotel. I don't know where he landed finally. Hmm. Um, but I tell that story because the, the point of the story is I'm the last person who ought to be evaluating my calling and gifts. Um, I need to have the eyes of someone else. Hmm. Um, I may think that I couldn't teach Sunday school, um, but some of the other people in the congregation may have observed me and and seen that I really do have a gift of relating to children and teaching, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I think one of the ways um, is um, is indeed to to be in the kind of conversation that coaching gives the opportunity to have. Um, but I do think it helps going into that conversation to realize that. Um, that the callings God gives to his people are many, many, many. And um, just because we think some callings are more special than others, that's not really true. The, the whole tapestry of humanity needs each one of us in, in, yep. in um, certain places. Yeah, I mean, I, I like how you put that, that the conversation really, like, that you you're the worst sort of judge about what your your particular and it's the same I, I from my own life I find that to be true the the callings that I have eventually gravitated towards you know fatherhood and um, pastoral ministry and things like that were things that in the beginning I kind of ran from actually I was more mm -hmm. uh, I was afraid of them I did not want to do them and it was because of other people telling me no you should really consider doing this um, Stanley yeah. Hauerwas has this great quote where he says, I, I realized I was a Christian, not because I sat down one day and said, okay, I decided to be a Christian today, but because other people were telling me, you know, you, you're a Christian, you realize that, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. It came from outside. And I think with vocation, it, it sometimes works that way where you have people like, you know, your parents when you're a kid telling you these things or your mm -hmm. pastor or teachers or things like that that are kind of guiding you along and are, are directing you in a sense, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, there's a, a great tool uh, that, you know, kind of a conceptual tool in coaching uh, the Jahari window it comes out of psychology as well. And, uh, you know, it, it talks about there are things that we know that nobody else knows about yeah. ourselves. There are things that other people know about us yeah. that we don't realize. Yep. And yeah. then the ones are, are the things that, that both don't know either myself or the other person, but we discover them together. That mm -hmm. That's the exciting stuff and how God yep. reveals in that. Um, yep. You know, Dr. Cobb, I, I want to run a, an analogy by you because you talked about don't worry about it because God's big enough to kind of figure things out and work through life to get you where you want. And yet there may be some things you can do. Um, I've always kind of seen, and especially kind of thinking in terms of Luther's teaching on vocation and God's will, um, like God's will is like whitewater rafting. Um, you know, <laughs> while I did a lot of whitewater rafting when I was younger. And while I had some skills to navigate the river and usually put the boat in the right places to have an excellent ride. There are also times though that river was going with such power that no matter how much I tried to navigate yeah. and got others to try to navigate in the boat, it was going to do what it was going to do. And, and we're not going in forward. We're going in backward or we're going in sidewards. And the advice was just make sure you fall in the boat. Don't fall out of the boat. That's, that's very dangerous. And I think that's a good analogy of God's will. There are things we can do to try to navigate but at the end of the day, God is God and his will will be done. Yeah. And and I think that, um, again, you talked uh, earlier uh, about the term righteousness and, and Luther's understanding that our righteousness is really twofold. 
And I like to talk about that in, in terms of we have a core identity, and that's child of God. And then we have a host of secondary identities that that take form in uh, the family uh, and our, our social immediate social life, uh, in our economic lives, in our uh, wider social lives, and in, in our congregational lives, our lives with other Christians. And, and to remember that that core identity is determined by God. It, Luther yep. called it passive righteousness. But to remember that no matter what, and no matter how many mistakes we make in assessing uh, where we ought to be and what we ought to be doing in life, we remain God's child. And that, that sort of foundation, that anchor, then gives us a certain freedom to experiment and, and to, uh, to make mistakes. We don't want to make mistakes. We, we want to, to uh, find the right family situation. We want to find the right uh, job. Uh, we want to vote the right way. We want to, um, we want to take part in the congregation as, as best we can. Um, but God helps us make up for lost time if we make a mistake. Yeah. And so while we need to take these things very seriously, we don't need to take them so seriously that we cripple ourselves by um, worrying about whether we make the right decision. Um, yeah. And that's freeing. I mean, that's freeing to know that, you know, um, yeah. you know, you might not get it right, but God has a way of to take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And that I also think that this kind of counters maybe some ideas that there's only one choice. You know, like there's only yeah. one spouse who is my soulmate. Who yeah, you know how me. I feel about that. Yes, Kevin, I, I we, Kevin had a whole that. rant on that one. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's just, yeah, it's like, uh, no, just 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 pick one. You can, you can, you'll agonize forever trying to figure out like God's great plan. Just don't, like, don't do that. Just trust that he's got it figured out and then just like do your best, okay? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like pick pick a spouse and and love them and be a good husband or a good yeah. good wife. That's, but but you know even if you don't make the best choice, God right. still can redeem that. Oh, absolutely. And work in it, and He can take you from where you are and do things that you never yeah, imagined possible. Yeah, my whole yeah, actually, my whole uh, Good Friday sermon this year was kind of based on that idea that on Good Friday we take something very very wicked, which is the cross. The cross is wicked, and we call it good. How can we call a wicked thing a good thing? Because God redeems it um, and yeah. God works through it. And that's the great kind of scandal, but also miracle of the Christian faith is that God forgives sinners through other sinners and God serves sinners through other sinners. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So it's yeah. a, it's freeing in that in that respect, because yeah. I'm I, even though I'm a sinner, I'm forgiven in Christ. And so I'm, I'm yep. free now to live out in service to my neighbor. Yeah. Dr. Cope, let me ask you this question. Um, one time I heard very early on in my journey on um, really diving into both coaching and Luther's teaching on vocation. And by the way, they kind of came in my life around the same period of time um, through a very difficult time of my life where I actually had to step out of ministry for about a year and a half. Um, and, and it was that that God kind of molded and shaped and remade me kind of a crucible moment. But I remember going to a church and, and hearing a pastor saying, you know, we have this great teaching on vocation. But honestly, and he said this from the pulpit, I don't know how to help you practically figure out what your calling is. What can churches do to take this great teaching that we have, that, that we're bringing out of the attic, we're, we're saying, hey, there's value, there's worth. What can congregations do to help their members more intentionally discover and live out their calling? Uh, I think talk about it um, as as individuals created in the image of a God who can't stop talking. Um, I think the the kind of thing we've been talking about uh, is of great help uh, to to know that you're not in this search alone for for where God wants you to be or where God can use you best. Um, and um, and then also to find in the congregation people who have similar situations, uh, who can tell stories uh, about the ups and the downs, the advantages and disadvantages. But I, I uh, when I taught at Concordia, uh, now University in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, we were members of a congregation that had a, a pretty wide spectrum of um, of occupational um, um, 
variety in the congregation, but a lot of middle and top man and some top managerial people. I remember uh, teaching a class on business ethics and being asked by one of the participants whom I knew very well um, what the what the proper Christian thing to do with with um, uh, the miles that you get from flying. And I said, oh, well, I think that's pretty simple, John. You just go with whatever your employer uh, has set as public policy, whether whether those miles belong to the company or whether they belong to you personally. And he said, no, you don't understand, Pastor. Um, I have to make the decision for my bank. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought he was an employee. He was the decision he was, maker. Yeah. He was the decision maker. <laughs> and so, um, but in that congregation, we got hit. Um, with uh, an economic downturn in which a number of um, middle-aged, mainly men, uh, all of a sudden didn't have the job that, you know, they were on the rise in the company and all of a sudden they were not with the company at all anymore mm. um, because uh, middle and lower upper management uh, is a good place to slash when you need to save money. Um, and and they almost immediately organized a small group in which they um, commiserated with each other, but they also counseled with each other. And um, and again, in that situation, the pastor was a part of the conversation. He was able to bring a dimension of uh, comfort and counsel uh, that helped them see over the over the edge of the hole that they had fallen into. Mm. But but I think those kinds of things on the congregational level um, provide openings for um, for support. And there will be other uh, avenues of support too in the congregation um, in, in so far as say the pastor or, or other congregational leaders um, know uh, helping guide people into uh, other other forms of help, other vocational possibilities. I think that that's important too. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Hey, um, as we get ready to wrap up here, what is maybe um, for our listening and viewing audience, just a, a final thought that you think is just really important about this teaching of Luther's on vocation or a word of encouragement that you would offer? Luther stressed uh, the presence of God. Um, he uh, said Nowhere is the Holy Spirit more present than in the pages of Scripture. Uh, and, and so I think um, part of our calling as individual members of congregations in that religious um, uh, uh, situation or walk of life, uh, to be in, in conversation with God in, in Bible reading and prayer, um, but to realize, again, as we've said uh, from a couple of different angles, God is present. He's hanging around. And uh, sometimes he's never more present uh, than when he seems to be absent. Hmm. And and those times when he seems to be absent are frequent enough in, in all of our lives, I think. Uh, he's just not doing the, th the thing that we think uh, a responsible God would do. Um, but to remember that he's there and he's... Um, First of all, he doesn't regard us as junk. Uh, our, our boss may have regarded us as junk as, as he fired us. Our spouse may have regarded us as junk as mm -hmm. uh, he or she went out the door. Um, uh, but but God doesn't regard us as junk. Mm -hmm. And he, he wants to um, incorporate us as his, um, well, as, as Paul would say, as his co-worker in taking care of, of others. He doesn't need any help in establishing our core identity and saving us, as yeah. we would usually say. Uh, he he uh, he did that alone on the cross and and uh, as he came out of the empty tomb. But um, but he he has so structured his world that he's in a sense dependent on us to get his care and and protection yep. and support across to other people. So I think that that idea that Luther so stressed that God is truly present um, in every moment of our lives, uh, especially when he seems to be most hidden, uh, 
is an important way to frame our yeah. our concept of of our callings. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very good. Well, uh, Dr. Cole, wonderful thank you stuff. so much. Yes. I appreciate it, and um, uh, we uh, just want to wish you God's blessings and uh, thank you for your work. And uh, when, when's the next time you're heading to Germany? Uh, sixty-eight days. Uh, sixty-eight days. You, you back and forth between uh, the U.S. and Germany quite a bit. Yeah, that's where where my sources are. Hey, this looks like a pretty good book. <laughs> well, hey, I thank you. I, now that I think about it, I've read it already. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes you, you got the abridged version there uh, <laughs> for my uh, my dissertation work. So, Yeah, and I, I, I've i read that altogether too many. Never mind. <laughs> um, um, this is the size book that uh, all of us can read. You know what? I was this, worried that it wasn't yes. thick enough. And my wife keeps Unlike, saying, remember today's world. People don't have as much attention span. They yeah. just want to get to the meat I'm like 99% of what I read in Confessions <laughs> too. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And and Joel Okamoto. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What's your name again? We can change grades. <laughs> I didn't actually, say that. Can't. I think I think it's actually illegal, but um, uh, no, I think I think packaging the extensive work you did um, in in this form. It's 124 pages. I think I just saw. No, here's 127. Um, but it, it's something that um, is is not going to discourage. Uh, both pastors and lay people from picking up and um, and moving through. So uh, I think think that's a great tool. I uh, shared it with three colleagues in our practical theology department. One got the Kindle version already, um, and uh, the other two are are um, looking forward to to making use of it. So wow! Well, there thank we you, thank you for those very kind words and endorsement. I appreciate that, and for sharing it with others. And thank you for uh, being here with us uh, on this podcast. Thanks, Doctor. It's Cobb. been yep. a joy. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Kevin. As we wrap up the podcast, what what should be a takeaway for our uh, listening and viewing audience? Uh, listen to Doctor. Kolb because he said it so much better than I ever would. <laughs> no, um, I, I think that uh, I heard a lot of of really good insight, but just that be yourself as trite as that sounds, you know, don't try to be anybody else because God put you together for yeah. a certain way and he put you together that way to love and serve your neighbor. So go do that. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I loved, uh, uh, right at the end, uh, he talked about this cooperation with God. We don't cooperate with God for salvation, No, but when it comes to our horizontal callings in life, there is a cooperation, a partnership that yeah, we have. Yeah. He lets and, us play an inning occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of nice. And that he works through us even as, as imperfect and messy as it may be, mm -hmm. um, he has a way of taking it and doing some amazing things through us Amen. to love and serve others. Amen. Hey, for our listening and viewing audience, thank you for joining us for this special edition of the Call to Be podcast, the uh, book launch for uh, my new book coming up. It's going to be launching on April 26th. Um, I did mention that uh, there is a special giveaway that we have, three copies. The first three individuals who email me with the special word vocation, not, not vacation, <laughs> But vocation, you email me with that word and uh, the first three individuals will get your address and get you a free copy of this book. Uh, with that, we want to thank, one, as we always do, uh, the Southeastern District and Malam for their generous gift that made this podcast possible. Uh, Kevin, thanks for being here. Good to see you. Dr. Cole, thanks. And with that, God's richest blessings. And we'll catch you next time for the Call to Be podcast. Take care, everybody.